he stepped down and vanished. There was a blinding flash of light, and the guests all blinked. When they opened their eyes, Bilbo was nowhere to be seen. One hundred and forty-four flabbergasted hobbits sat back speechless. Old Odo Proudfoot removed his foot from the table and stamped. Then there was a dead silence, until suddenly, after several deep breaths, every Baggins, Boffins, Took, Brandy Buck, Grub, Chub, Burrows, Bolger, Brace Girdle, Brockhouse, Good Body, Hornblower, and Proudfoot began to talk at once. It was generally agreed that the joke was in very bad taste, and more food and drink were needed to cure the guests of shock and annoyance. He's mad, I always said so, was probably the most popular comment. Even the Tooks, with a few exceptions, thought Bilbo's behavior was absurd. For the moment, most of them took it for granted that his disappearance was nothing more than a ridiculous prank. But old Rory Brandybuck was not so sure. Then he went in. He took off his party clothes, folded up and wrapped in tissue paper his embroidered silk waistcoat and put it away. Then he put on quickly some old untidy garments and fastened around his waist a worn leather belt. On it he had hung a short sword and a bather black he had sat silent beside Bilbo's empty chair and ignored all remarks and questions he had enjoyed the joke of course even though he had been in the know he had difficulty in keeping from laughter at the indignant surprise of the guests but at the same time he felt deeply troubled he realized suddenly that he loved the old hobbit dearly most of the guests went on drinking and eating and discussing Bilbo Baggins' oddities, past and present, but the Saxville Baggins had already departed in wrath. Frodo did not want to have any more to do with the party. He gave orders to more wine to be served. He got up and drained his own glass silently to the health of Bilbo and slipped out of the pavilion. As for Bilbo Baggins, even while he was making his speech, he had been fingering the old gold ring in his pocket, his magic ring that he had kept secret for so many years. As he had stepped down, he had slipped it onto his finger, and he was never seen by any hobbit or in Hobbleton again. He walked briskly back to his hole and stood for a moment, listening with a smile to the din in the pavilion and to the sounds of the merrymaking in the other parts of the field. Then he went in. He took off his party clothes, folded up and wrapped in tissue paper his embroidered silk waistcoat, and put it away. Then he put on quickly some old untidy garments and fastened round his waist a worn leather belt. On it he hung a short sword in a battered black leather scabbard, from a locked drawer smelling of mothballs, he took out an old cloak and hood. They had been locked up as if they were very precious, but they were so patched and weather-stained that their original color could hardly be guessed. It might have been a dark green. They were rather too large for him. He then went into his study and from a large strong box took out a bundle wrapped in old clothes and a leather-bound manuscript, and also a large bulky envelope. The book and the bundle he stuffed into the top of a heavy bag that was standing there, already nearly full. Into the envelope he slipped his golden ring and his fine chain, and then sealed it and addressed it to Frodo. At first he put it onto the mantelpiece, but suddenly he removed it and stuck it into his pocket. At that moment, the door opened, and Gandalf come quickly in. Hello, said Bilbo. I wondered if you would turn up. I'm glad to have found you visible, replied the wizard, 
sitting down in a chair. I wanted to catch you and have a few final words. I suppose you feel that everything has gone off splendidly and according to your plan. Yes, I do, said Bilbo. Though that flash was rather surprising, it quite startled me, let alone the others. A little addition of your own, I suppose? It was. You have wisely kept that ring secret for all these years, and it, and it seemed to me necessary to give your guests something else that would seem to explain your sudden vanishment, and would spoil my joke. You are an interfering old busybody, laughed Bilbo but I expect you know the best as usual. I do, when I know everything, but I don't feel too sure about this whole affair. It has now come to the final point. You have had your joke and alarmed or offended most of your relations and given the whole shire something to talk about for nine days or ninety-nine more likely. Are you going any further? Yes, I am. I feel I need a holiday, a very long holiday, as I have told you before. Maybe a permanent holiday. I don't expect I shall return. In fact, I don't mean to, and I have made all arrangements. I am old, Gandalf. I don't look it, but I am feeling the beginning of it in my heart of hearts. Well preserved, indeed, he snorted. Well, I feel all thin, sort of stretched, if you know what I mean, like butter that has been scraped over too much bread. That can't be right. I need a change or something. Gandalf looked curiously and closely at him. No, it does not seem right, he said thoughtfully. No, after all, I believe your plan is probably the best. Well... I've made up my mind anyway. I want to see mountains again, Gandalf. Mountains! And then find somewhere where I can rest, in peace and quiet, without a lot of relatives prying around and a string of confounded visitors hanging on the bell. I might find somewhere where I can finish my book. I have thought of a nice ending for it, and he lived happily ever after, after to the end of his days. Gandalf laughed. I hope you will, but nobody will read the book, however it ends. Oh, they may in years to come. Frodo has read some already, as far as it has gone. You'll keep an eye on Frodo, won't you? Yes, I will. Two eyes as often as I can spare them. He would come to me, of course, if I asked him. In fact, he offered to once, just before the party. But he d does not really want to yet. I want to see the wild country again before I die, and the mountains. But he is still in love with the Shire, with woods and fields and little rivers. He ought to be comfortable here. I am leaving everything to him. Of course, except a few oddments, I hope he will be happy when he gets used to being on his own. It's time he was his own master now. Everything, said Gandalf. The ring as well. You agreed to that, you remember. Well, er, yes, I suppose so, stammered Bilbo. Where is it? In an envelope, if you must know, said Bilbo impatiently. There, on the mantelpiece. Well, no, there, here it is in my pocket, he hesitated. Isn't that odd now, he said softly to himself. Yet, after all, why not? Why shouldn't it stay there? Gandalf looked again very hard at Bilbo, and there was a gleam in his eyes. I think, Bilbo, he said quietly, I should leave it behind. Don't you want to? Well, yes, and uh, no. Now it comes to it, I don't like parting with it at all, I might say. And I don't really see why I should. Why do you want me to, he asked, and a curious change came over his voice. It was sharp with suspicion and annoyance. 
you're always badgering me about my ring, but you have never bothered me about the other things that I got on my journey. No, but I had to badger you, he said Gandalf. I wanted the truth. It was important. Magic rings are, well, magical, and they are rare and curious. I was professionally interested in your ring, you might say, and I still am. I should like to know where it is if you go wandering again. Also, I think you have had it quite too long. You don't need it any more, Bilbo, unless I am quite mistaken. Bilbo flushed, and there was an angry light in his eyes. His face grew hard. Why not, he cried, and what business is it of yours anyway, anyhow, to know what I do with my own things? It is my own. I found it. It came to me. Yes, yes, said Gandalf, but there is no need to get angry. If I am, it is your fault, said Bilbo. It is mine, I tell you, my own, my precious, yes, my precious. The wizard's face remained grave and attentive, and only a flicker in his deep eyes showed that he was startled and indeed alarmed. It has been called that before, he said, but not by you. But I say it now, and why not? Even if Golem said the same once, it's not his now, but mine, and I shall keep it, I say. Gandalf stood up. He spoke sternly. You will be a fool if you do, Bilbo, he said. You make that clear with every word you say. It has got far too much hold on you. Let it go, and then you can go yourself and be free. I'll do as I choose and go as I please, said Bilbo obstinately. Now, now, my dear hobbit, said Gandalf. All your long life we have been friends, and you owe me something. Come, do as you promised, give it up. Well, if you want my ring yourself, say so, said Bilbo, but you won't get it. I won't give my precious away, I tell you. His hands strayed to the hilt of his small sword. Gandalf's eyes flashed. It will be my turn to get angry soon, he said. If you say that again, I shall. Then you will see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. He took a step towards the hobbit, and he s seemed to grow tall and menacing. His shadow filled the little room. Bilbo backed away to the wall, breathing hard, his hand clutching at his pocket. They stood for a while facing one another, and the air of the room tingled. Gandalf's eyes remained bent on the hobbit. Slowly his hands relaxed and he began to tremble. I don't know what has come over you, Gandalf, he said. You have never been like this before. What is it all about? It is mine, isn't it? I found it, and Golem would have killed me if I hadn't kept it. I'm not a thief, whatever he said. I have never called you one, Gandalf answered, and I am not one either. I am not trying to rob you, but to help you. I wish you would trust me as you used to. He turned away, and the shadow passed. He seemed to dwindle again to an old gray man, bent and troubled. Bilbo drew his hand over his eyes. I am sorry, he said, but I have never felt so queer, and yet... It would be a relief in a way not to be bothered with it any more. It has been so growing on my mind lately. Sometimes I have felt it was like an eye looking at me. And I am always wanting to put it on and disappear. Don't you know, or wondering if it is safe and pulling it out to make sure. I tried locking it up, but I found I couldn't rest without it in my pocket. I don't know why, and... I don't seem to be make up my mind. Then trust mine, said Gandalf. It is quite made up. Go away and leave it behind. Stop possessing it. Give it to Frodo and I will look after him. Bilbo stood for a moment, tense and undecided. 
Presently, he sighed. All right, he said with an effort. I will. Then he shrugged his shoulders and smiled rather ruefully. After all, that's what his party business is all about, really. To give away lots of birthday presents and somehow make it easier to give away at the same time. It hasn't made it any easier in the end, but it would be a pity to waste all my preparations. It would quite spoil the joke. Indeed, it would take away the only point I ever saw in the affair, said Gandalf. Very well, said Bilbo. It goes to Frodo with all the rest. He drew a deep breath, and now I really must be starting, or somebody else will catch me. I have said goodbye, and I couldn't bear to do it all over again. He picked up his bag and moved to the door. You still have the ring in your pocket, said the wizard. Well, so I have, cried Bilbo, and my will and all the other documents, too. You had better take it and deliver it for me. That would be the safest. No, don't give the ring to me, said Gandalf. Put it on the mantelpiece. It will be safe enough there till Frodo comes. I shall wait for him. Bilbo took out the envelope, but just as he was about to set it by the clock, his hand jerked back, and the packet fell to the floor. Before he could pick it up, the wizard stooped in and seized it, and set it in its place. A spasm of anger passed swiftly over the hobbit's face again. Suddenly it gave way to a look of relief and a laugh. Well, that's that, he said. Now I'm off. They went out into the hall. Bilbo chose his favorite stick from the stand. Then he whistled. Three dwarves came out of different rooms where they had been busy. Is everyone ready? asked Bilbo. Everything packed and labeled? Everything, they answered. Well, let's start then. He stepped out of the front door. It was a fine night and... The black sky was dotted with stars. He looked up, sniffing the air. What fun! What fun to be off again. Off on the road with dwarves. This is what I really have been longing for. For years. Goodbye, he said, looking at his old home. And bowing to the door. Goodbye, Gandalf. Goodbye for the present, Bilbo. Take care of yourself. You are old enough and... Perhaps wise enough. Take care. I don't care. Don't you worry about me. I am as happy now as I have ever been. And that is saying a great deal. But the time has come. I am being swept off my feet at least, he added. And then in a low voice, as if to himself, he sang softly in the dark. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow, if I can, pursuing it with eager feet, until it joins some larger way where many paths and errands meet. And whither then, I cannot say. He paused, silent, for a moment. Then, without another word, he turned away from the light and the voices in the field and the tents, and followed by his three companions, went round into this garden and trotted down the long sloping path. He jumped down a, over a little place in the hedge at the bottom and took to the meadows, passing in the night like a rustle of wind in the grass. Gandalf remained for a while, staring after him into the darkness. Goodbye, my dear Bilbo, until our next meeting, he said softly and went indoors. Frodo came in soon afterwards and found him sitting in the dark, deep in thought. Has he gone? he asked. Yes, answered Gandalf. He is gone at last. I wish, uh, I mean, I hoped until his evening that it was only a joke, said Frodo. 
but I knew in my heart that he really meant to go. He always used to joke about serious things. I wish I had come back sooner just to see him off. I think really he preferred slipping off quietly in the end, said Gandalf. Don't be too troubled. He'll be all right now. He left a packet for you. There it is. Frodo took the envelope from the mantelpiece and glanced at it, but did not open it. You'll find his will and all the other documents in there, I think, said the wizard. You are the master of Bag End now, and also, I fancy you'll find a golden ring. The ring? exclaimed Frodo. Has he left me that? I wonder why. Still, it may be useful. It may and it may not, said Gandalf. I should not make use of it if I were you, but keep it secret and keep it safe. Now I am going to bed. As master of Bag End, Frodo felt it his painful duty to say goodbye to the guests. Rumors of strange events had by now spread all over the field, but Frodo would only say no doubt. Everything will be cleared up in the morning. About midnight, carriages came from the important folk. One by one they rolled away, filled with full but very unsatisfied hobbits. Gardeners came by an arrangement and removed in wheelbarrows those that had inadvertently remained behind. Night slowly passed, the sun rose, the hobbits rose rather later. Morning went on, people came and began by orders to clear away the pavilion and the tables and the chairs and the spoons and the knives and bottles and plates and the lanterns and the flowering shrubs and bushes and boxes and the crumbs and the cracker paper and forgotten bags and the gloves and handkerchiefs and the uneaten food a very small item I might add then a number of other people came without orders Baggins and Boffins and Bulgers and the Tooks and the other guests that lived or were staying near by midday when even the best fed were out and about again there was a large crowd at Bag End uninvited but not unexpected Frodo was waiting on the steps smiling but looking rather tired and worried. He welcomed all the callers, but he had not much more to say than before. His reply to all inquiries was simply this. Mr. Bilbo Baggins has gone away, as far as I know, for good. Some of the visitors he invited to come inside as Bilbo left messages for them. Inside the hall were piled a large assortment of packages and parcels and small articles of furniture. On every item there was a label tied. There were several labels of this sort for Adelard Took, for his very own, from Bilbo. On an umbrella, Adelard, he carried off many unlabeled ones for Dora Baggins, in memory of a long correspondence with love from Bilbo. On a large waste paper basket, Dora was Drogo's sister and the eldest surviving female relative, Bilbo and Frodo. She was 99 and had written reams of good advice for more than a half a century for Milo Burroughs, hoping it will be useful from B.B. on a gold pen and ink bottle. Milo never answered letters for Angelica's use from Uncle Bilbo on a round convex mare. She was a young Baggins and too obviously considered in her face sharply. For the collection of Hugo brace girdle from a contributor on a empty bookcase. 
Hugo was a great borrower of books and worse than usual at returning them. For Lobelia Saxville Baggins as a present on a case of silver spoons. Bilbo believed that she had acquired a good many of his spoons while she was away on his former journey. Lobelia knew that quite well when she arrived later that day. She took the point at once, but she also took the spoons. This is only a small selection of the assembled presents. Bilbo's residence had got rather cluttered up with things in the course of his long life. It was a tendency of hobbit holes to get cluttered up, for which the custom of giving so many birthday presents was largely responsible. Not, of course, that the birthday presents were always new. There were one or two old mathems of forgotten uses that had circulated around the district, but Bilbo had usually given new presents and had kept those that he had received. The old hole was now being cleared a little. Every one of the various parting gifts had labels written out personally by Bilbo and several had some point or some joke, but of course most of the things were given where they would have been wanted or welcomed. The poor hobbits and especially those of Bagshot Row did very well. The old gaffer Gamgee got two sacks of potatoes and a new spade, a woolen waistcoat and a bottle of ointment for creaking joints. Old Rory Braddy Buck in return for much hospitality, but a dozen bottles of old wine arts and a strong red wine from the South Farling, and now quite mature as it had been laid down for by Bilbo's father. Rory quite forgave Bilbo and voted him a capital fellow after the first bottle. There was plenty of everything left for Frodo and of course all the chief treasures as well as the books, pictures, and more than enough furniture were left in his possession. There was, however, no sign nor mention of money or jewelry. Not a penny piece or a glass bead was given away. Frodo had a very tiring time that afternoon. A false rumor that the whole household was being distributed free spread like wildfire, and before long the place was packed with people who had no business there but could not be kept out. Labels got torn off and mixed, and quarrels broke out. Some people tried to do swaps and deals in the hall, and others tried to make off with minor items not addressed to them, or with anything that seemed unwanted or unwatched. The road to the gate was blocked with barrows and handcarts. In the middle of the commotion, the Saxville Baggins arrived. Frodo had retired for a while and left his friend Mary Brandybuck to keep an eye on things when Altho loudly demanded to see Frodo. Mary bowed politely. He is indisposed, he said. He is resting. Hiding, you mean, said Lobelia. Anyway, we want to see him, and we mean to see him. Just go and tell him so. Mary left him a long while in the hall, and they had time to sc discover their parting gifts of spoons. It did not improve their tempers. Eventually... They were shown into the study. Frodo was sitting at the table with a lot of papers in front of him. He looked indisposed to see Saxville Bagginses at any rate, and he stood up fidgeting with something in his pocket, but he spoke quite politely. The Saxville Bagginses were rather offensive. They began by offering him bad bargain prices as between friends for various valuable and unlabeled things. When Frodo replied that only the things especially directed by Bilbo were being given away, they said the whole affair was very fishy. Only one thing is clear to me, said Altho, and that is that you are doing exceedingly well out of it. I insist on seeing the will. Altho would have been Bilbo's heir, but for the adoption of Frodo. 
He read the will carefully and snorted. It was, unfortunately, very clear and correct, according to the legal customs of hobbits, which demand, among other things, seven signatures of witnesses in red ink. Foiled again, he said to his wife, and after waiting sixty years. Spoons? Fiddlesticks! He snapped his fingers under Frodo's nose and stomped off. But Lobelia was not easy to get rid of. A little later, Frodo came out of the study to see how things were going on, and he found her still about the place, investigating nooks and corners and tapping the floors. He escorted her firmly off the premises after he had relieved her of several small but rather valuable articles that had somehow fallen inside of her umbrella. Her face looked as if she was in the throes of thinking out a really crushing parting remark, but all she found to say, turning around on the steps, was, You'll live to regret it, young fellow. Why didn't you go, too? You don't belong here. You're no baggins. You're, you, you're a brandy buck. Did you hear that, Mary? That was an insult, if you like, said Frodo as he shut the door on her. It was a compliment, said Mary Brandybuck, and so, of course, not true. <laughs> then they went out around the hole and evicted three young rabbits, two boffins and a bulger who were knocking holes in the walls of one of the cellars. Frodo also had a tussle with young Sancho Proudfoot, old Odo Proudfoot's grandson, who had begun a excavation in the larger pantry where he thought there was an echo. The legend of Bilbo's gold excited both curiosity and hope, for legendary gold mysteriously obtained, if not positively ill-gotten, is, as everyone knows, anyone's for the finding unless the search is interrupted. When he had overcome Sancho and pushed him out, Frodo collapsed on a chair in the hall. It's time to close the shop, Mary, he said. Lock the door and don't open it to anyone today, not even if they bring a battering ram. Then he went to revive himself with a belated cup of tea. He had hardly sat down when there came a soft knock at the front door. Lobelia again, most likely, he thought, but she must have thought of something really nasty and have come back again to say it. It can wait. He went on with his tea. The knock was repeated, much louder, but he took no notice. Suddenly the wizard's head appeared at the window. If you don't let me in, Frodo, I shall blow your door right down your hole and out through the hill, he said. My dear Kandoff, half a minute, cried Frodo, running out of the room to the door. Come in, come in, I thought it was Lobelia. Then I forgive you, but I saw her some time ago driving a pony trap towards Bywater with a face that would have curdled new milk. She had already nearly curdled me. Honestly, I nearly tried on Bilbo's ring. I had longed to disappear. Don't do that, said Gandalf, sitting down. Do be careful of that ring, Frodo. In fact, it is partly about that I have come to say a last word. Well, what about it? What do you know already? Only that Bilbo told me I have heard this story, how he found it, and how he used it. On his journey, I mean. Which story, I wonder, said Gandalf. Oh, not what he told the dwarves and put in his book, said Frodo. He told me the true story soon after I came to live here. He said you had pestered him till he told you, so I had better know too. No secrets between us, Frodo, he said, but they are not to go for any further. It's mine anyway. That's interesting, said Gandalf. Well, what did you think of it all? If you mean inventing all that about a present, 
Well, I thought the true story was much more likely, and I couldn't see the point of altering it at all. It was very unlike Bilbo to do so. Anyway, and I thought it rather odd. So did I, but odd things may happen to people that have such treasures, if they use them. Let it be a warning to you to be very careful with it. It may have other powers than making you vanish just when you wish to. I don't understand, said Frodo. Neither do I, answered the wizard. I have merely begun to wonder about the ring, especially since last night. No need to worry, but if you take my advice, you will use it very seldom, or not at all. At least I beg you not to use it in any way that will cause talk or arouse suspicion. I say again, keep it safe and keep it secret. You are very mysterious. What are you afraid of? I'm not certain, so I sh will say no more. I may be able to tell you something when I come back. I am going off at once, so this is goodbye for the present. He got up. At once? cried Frodo. Why, I thought you were staying on for at least a week. I was looking forward to your help. I did mean to, but I have had to change my mind. I may be away for a good while, but I'll come and see you again as soon as I can. Expect me when you see me. I shall slip in quietly. I shan't often be visiting the Shire openly again. I find that I have become rather unpopular. They say I am a nuisance and a disturber of the beasts. Some people are actually accusing me of spiriting Bilbo away, or worse. If you want to know, there is supposed to be a plot between you and me to get a hold of his wealth. Some people, exclaimed Frodo. You mean Otho and Lobelia. How abominable. I would give them Bag End and everything else if I could get Bilbo back and go off tramping into the country with him. I love the Shire, but I begin to wish somehow that I had gone too. I wonder if I shall ever see him again. So do I, said Gandalf, and I wonder many other things. Goodbye now. Take care of yourself. Look out for me especially at unlikely times. Goodbye. Frodo saw him at to the door. He gave a final wave of his hand and walked off at a surprising pace, but Frodo thought the old wizard looked unusually bent, almost as if he was carrying a great weight. The evening was closing in, and his cloaked figure quickly vanished into the twilight. Frodo did not see him again for a long time.